California's Gold is produced in association with KCET Los Angeles and is seen statewide on California public television. This series is endorsed by the California Teachers Association, the California School Boards Association, and the California Library Association. Hello everybody, I'm Huell Hauser. And here we are on this beautiful morning on the beautiful campus of Stanford University in Palo Alto. Right now we're in the main quad, the old Memorial Court, which is one of the oldest areas on the entire campus. We have come here in search of a very important chapter in California's history. And in order for this adventure to work, we're looking for three ingredients, an old camera, an old barn, and a horse. And if we can find all three of them here at Stanford, not only are we in for a treat and a real honest-to-goodness adventure, but we'll be uncovering a wonderful example of California's gold. <music> You know, the Stanford campus is beautiful, filled with architectural and natural beauty. And there was energy in the air as students were heading to and from classes. We were heading somewhere too, on a mission. Our first stop, the Cantor Center for Visual Arts. It was there we met up with our host for the day, walked up the steps, and began our adventure. Okay, we are inside the museum. We're standing in this exhibit that's been entitled Time Stands Still and Patience. That's a perfect title for what we're getting ready to find out about, isn't it? It sure is. This is about early motion photography in the mid-19th century. Motion photography. Now, what are we talking about? Well, from the earliest days of photography, there was this challenge to be able to capture on film moments, not just frozen long periods, but breaking waves, flying birds, juggling balls, all kinds of things that happen instantaneously. Because in a lot of the old photographs that I've seen, everybody is standing very still and very right. erect, and the only blur in the picture was the horse or the dog whose head was moving because they had to stand still in front of a camera for what? 15, 20, 30 seconds? Oh, minutes, minutes. People were bracketed into place. And the film was slow, the plates were slow, the lenses were slow. So the idea of clicking a shutter as we do today just wasn't a possibility. OK, let's talk a little bit about motion, because this exhibit is absolutely wonderful. This picture right here captures it better than, than any story could, <laughs> something as simple as a breaking wave was revolutionary. When was this picture taken? 1857. Really? It's that old? Yes, by a French photographer, Gustave Le Gray. And this was a, the idea of a tourist shot that would show people about their seaside visits that really captured it instead of being just a big blur was revolutionary. So the idea was this picture captured the wave in motion. Yes. Indeed. How did he do that? Well, uh, I guess that's what every <laughs> other photographer in the world wanted to know. Yes, and, and Le Gray was one of many people around the world before the days of uh, Edward Muybridge trying to find a way to, to freeze time on film. And did it all kind of come together at one time? Was everybody kind of working in the same direction? Well, in about the 1870s, it did start to come together, and it came together with Edward Muybridge. There's the name. There's the name. That's the reason we're here. His name again? Edward Muybridge. And in order to talk about Muybridge, we have to start with old Leland Stanford, who founded Stanford University. That's the connection that brings us here. And the connection is that the university sits on the property that had been Leland Stanford's horse farm. He raised prize-winning racehorses. And he hired Edward Muybridge 
to take photographs because he wanted to know whether a cantering horse actually had all four hooves off the ground at the same time. So was Morbridge known in this area? Was he doing this kind of groundbreaking action photography at the time? No, this was the first. He was known as a, as a, a high quality photographer. He was comparable to Carlton Watkins, another name that's known from that era. And he was known for the scenic work that he had done at Yosemite and elsewhere. So Stanford hired him to document running horses. Running horses. And that gets us into this whole exhibit over here because these are all photographs that Moorbridge took of horses. And what was the deal with wanting to photograph horses. Was it just because they moved? Well, it was because Leland Stanford was breeding horses. He wanted to study what made a horse tick, so to speak. He wanted to know everything about the stock that he was raising. So no one had been able to capture this. We take this for granted. We think, oh, you know, we know what a running horse looks like. But at the time, no one had caught it, and it was faster than the human eye could see. So it really was unknown whether all four hooves were ever off the ground at one time. So his idea, now for example, this, this horse is jumping here. Yes. And you can see from the different cells, the different plates that were each capturing part of the motion, that he's freezing in action as a silhouette because the film wasn't, the plates weren't that fast, mostly as a silhouette, freezing every step, literal step, of the activity. Wow, and this whole room is filled. Running. Now, wait a minute, here's a guy jumping. <laughs> He's doing somersaults. Here's somersaults up here, a lot of fun. And seeing, here's jumping, showing humans. This was the beginning of Moybridge's whole career in, in what he called animal motion studies, and he spent decades doing this. And all these people, these are just different little vignettes. Yes, of, in this case, uh, ac not acrobats, but athletes flexing their muscles. Wow, this is, here's some boxers over here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Someone running, just the idea of someone running. Yes, and these photographs were of immense importance to other artists, to scientists, to everyone who was interested in studying the human form, the animal form. These were really making a huge difference in the visual world. You're right, we take that for granted, we being do. able to capture something in motion. Back then, this was revolutionary. It was. Here's a lady who's jumping up over a stool. Yes, in full skirt and wearing her hat and her boots, so she's fully clothed with her petticoats, pulling them up, and doing a rather unladylike jump over a stool. So just the simplest things, the idea that they were moving in sequence, made this revolutionary. Well, and photographs like this were very valuable to, for instance, painters who wanted to show a figure in mo motion and would have a photograph that they could refer to to indicate naturally how that actually occurs. Right. So in other words, in the past, models for photographers would pose. Now, for painters. For painters or for photographers. Would pose. Now, Moorbridge has them leaping over stools. Yes, and making that motion real. Seeing what you couldn't see with the naked eye, clearly to see how the shoulders move, how the knees move at the same time. We even have elephants here. <laughs> yes, and as I mentioned earlier, he uh, was interested in animals in motion, and he did studies of all types of things, dogs, elephants, birds. Just to see a move. Just to see the move and just to study them. Scientists were fascinated by this. Now, this is the era of Darwin, so the whole study of the natural world is on a lot of people's minds. And here, is his photographic apparatus. I don't even know really what to call it. It looks like something, uh, well, I'm not sure what it looks like, not like anything I've ever seen before, but this was all very innovative on his part. Well, and invented. He devised equipment to do what he wanted to do. For instance, this multiple lens board here was devised 
because he wanted to be able to show his subjects obliquely, not just in the silhouettes we've been looking at, but from the side front or the side back. Well, there are like nine lenses there. Yes, and there's all kinds of peculiar gadgets, devices that were handmade, hand-tooled for Mybridge's experiments. So when he was using, would, would he actually take pictures with this thing? Oh yes, oh yes. And think, we don't, they didn't have roll film. They had wet collodion plates. They were working with wet chemistry. They had to shoot it and develop it while it was still wet. So the, the technical obstacles they had to overcome were immense. And they were literally flying by the seat of their pants. They didn't have anything to go by. They were inventing this as they went along. Yes, he was a pioneer. Well, we've seen how Moybridge shot these pictures. Now we're seeing the equivalent of uh, a roll of film, a roll of motion picture film back in its day. This was the earliest step toward projecting images, and these are multiples. They actually are drawn from photographs because a photograph itself wouldn't work. Now these are horses. Horses, monkeys climbing a tree, tree with coconuts, a dancing woman. Oh my God! A running dog. Now, are these photographs on here, or are these drawings? They are drawings, because they needed to be elongated to work in the projection mechanism. Well, where did the pictures come in that he was taking with those cameras? Well, they, these were drawn from photographs. So it, uh, again, projected. These gave the illusion of photograph being projected, but they're actually a drawing in the interim. Exact drawings of the exact pictures. Elongated. If you look at these, the horses have elongated trunks, and ah. that's because the projection system tends to um, shorten them. There's a lot of illusion here. A lot of and illusion. And there's Moybridge right here. Yes, on the cover of the Illustrated London News. So he was, was he famous? He was, was famous. This really, this was, he was really making a name for himself, oh, what absolutely. he was doing. There were photographers and artists elsewhere around the world who were working from his photographs, trying to refine his process, trying to better understand it. His work was widely published and very important. And now for the piece de resistance, because patience, this was Morbridge's, this was kind of the modern day projector. This is the first machine, his machine called a zoopraxiscope. Wait which, a minute, a what? A zoopraxiscope, which takes the equivalent of a photograph, actually drawings, and projects them onto the wall. And they move. That's and what's important. They're multiple, they're from the wheels, and they are spun around, and we can push the button, which will oh, start let's do what it. originally was kerosene lit. Here we go. Oh my gosh, it just goes around and projects this horse running on the wall. Look at this, it's very simple. It's two wheels, one wheel with the drawings and it's spinning in the opposite direction of a wheel with slots and the slots allow the drawings to come through. And when did he invent this? 1879. Now, back then, this would have been operated how? It was illuminated by kerosene, not by electronic with a, it had a crank, but it didn't have the illumination we have today. And what would they have done? Just, they could have uh, increased or decreased the speed at which the horses were running. Yes, so you can see them slower. Or by how fast you would turn the, the handle. Exactly. And what would they do? Just sit for hours had watched the same horse go around. There were only about 50 or, or less pictures on each reel. Well, each reel is a specific subject. So there are other reels that are here on display of a woman dancing, monkeys <laughs> climbing the tree. So yes, it's a little snippet of something that's amusing. Now, Patience and I have left the museum, and Patience, we have come to what is probably the most historic spot on the Stanford campus, and it has a direct tie-in with Edward Moybridge and those pictures in motion. Indeed. The property that is the university started as the Stanford Horse Farm, and the Stanfords had a teenage son, Leland Jr., who died 
and they dedicated this whole property to become a university for the children of California. So that's why the Stanford campus is known as the farm. Okay, now what's the connection between the farm and this historic old barn that goes back to the 1880s and the motion pictures of Moybridge. Yes, well, this is the site. This is the piece of the property that Moybridge set up with another barn that's no longer standing to do his motion studies of horses running. Okay, so this is where the famous horse pictures were made, and all of this was commissioned by Leland Stanford uh, to bring Moybridge out here to the farm to photograph these horses. Right, so here's the complete cycle. This is the story of the horse farm, the horses, the photographs, and then how the university got underway and is still here today with its riding stables in the 21st century. And what we have done, we've got a little living history, a little recreation going on over here because what have you done, Patience? Well, we pulled together some photographic students and other students from Stanford and a lot of other people interested in photography and they've come out today to photograph the horse. You've put the call out for everybody we did. because what we're going to do, we've got a horse and a rider and we've got photographers here and we're going to in our own way on this very historic spot recreate what happened here well over a hundred years ago. Indeed, and everybody's ready. Now, is everybody, does everybody know the history of Moybridge and why this spot is so historic in the history of photography? Yeah, it's a real honor for us all to be here. Uh, you know, Moybridge, as you know, was such an eccentric Englishman who came to America and fell out of a wagon train while crossing America. Now, these are stories that patients hadn't been telling us. These oh, are some pretty yeah. good stories. It gets even better because uh, when he was in the hospital convalescing, that's when he taught himself photography and then went on to become a a landscape photographer and then Leland Stanford chose him to win a bet for him with with uh, the racehorses here. What kind of a bet? Well you know rumor has it that uh, Leland Stanford a wealthy horse raiser and rancher bet a, a fellow rancher uh, $25,000 to determine uh, one of them bet that that at some point in the gallop all four hoofs are off the ground and that was Leland's position which was a good good opinion to have uh, as Moybridge later uh, proved and the other rancher was willing to put up that much money um, to bet on the fact that there's no point in a horse's gallop when there isn't at least one hoof still touching the ground. Wow. Now everybody else familiar with Moybridge? I guess anybody who studies photography knows Moorbridge, don't you? I've seen some of his work, yeah. Yeah, did you know it was done here? I, I just learned on Saturday that it was oh. done here. <laughs> okay, good. Everybody else know about it? Everybody is overwhelmed with the history of this moment. <laughs> and <laughs> what we're gonna do is just kind of set you all up. Now, Patience, when it was done originally, there was a lot of setup to this, wasn't there? There was a barn that no longer stands, and it had 12 cubicles with 12 cameras that were set up with wet collodion plates, intensive process, 12 trip wires on the on the track. Track was laid with white lime so it would be reflective. There was a white wall to be reflective, and as the horses ran past, they tripped the wires. All 12 cameras would take off. Wow, that's what caused the sequence down the way. And it would have been done right out here like this. Now, we don't have any trip wires here. We're going to be using, what kind of cameras are you using well, we, today? We've got an, uh, a photographer for each camera today. And uh, I brought, uh, I'm kind of covering both bases, high technology and low technology, although we have some excellent digital cameras here today. But I brought a big medium format camera that takes a, a huge black and white negative. And then I brought this fun little cult camera that many people know about, these lovable Holgas, which have a plastic lens. They're about $18, and uh, they uh, take slightly vignetted, blurry pictures, which might have a kind of a nostalgia to it. And what kind of camera have you got? Uh, the standard issue SLR camera. What kind of camera? I'm using a Canon PowerShot G2. Okay. Um, D40 Zoom, it's a digital camera. Okay. <laughs> The Nikon N65. Okay. A Canon Elf. The <laughs> uh, Canon 1DS digital SLR. Now this guy looks serious <laughs> here with this camera right here. You know, you wonder what Moybridge would have thought about all these cameras, because he was really starting from scratch, wasn't he? Well, you're right. I think Stanford chose him because uh, 
Muybridge had uh, a head start on most other photographers in developing his own shutter speeds. You know, he, as you know, in the 1870s, he got speeds up over a thousandth of a second, which was way out ahead of everyone else who was still shooting at maybe one second. Those are the pictures that he took that capture waves up in the, you know, and, and motion. You're right. For the first time. That's right. And, and even freezing horses' hoofs in the middle of a gallop which took probably a thousandth of one second to freeze and make visible. Well, it sounds like the horse is ready. You ready to go out and do your bit? Yep, we are. You know, you're going to be uh, recreating history here. Yes, I do. And you're just going to gallop around, and we're all going to position ourselves around the uh, fencing here and go to it. Let's recreate some history here. So here we go, patience, and we have everybody lined up here going at it. They're all having a good time. Everyone's thinking this is a modern version of an historic event. Now is this, this is the way it would have been done, that the trip wires would have been all up and down here. And well, the horse would have just been going by in the front. The track was a probably what must have been an oval, but it was a straight track in front of the barn and a straight shot with 12 wires. See here everybody goes. Now he had to work at a distance from the horse. He couldn't photograph the horse close up, partly because the speed of the of the chemistry required certain distance. Now certain would the horse be going length. about this speed? Cantering, which I think may be faster than what we're looking at. We're looking at a fast walk that may be not yet up to a trot. But I'm isn't it interesting? Every camera that's being used today can capture this motion <laughs> very quickly. Back then, that was revolutionary. Yes, it was. And people ask, why was Moybridge able to do this when others couldn't? Part of it was that he had excellent lenses. He was being financed by Stanford, who was very well off and could afford that. Part of it was the California sunshine, fast exposures because of bright light. Ah, well, let's walk over and see how some of our photographers. Now you're getting ready to shoot the horse just as it comes by, right? Yes, I am. Yep. Okay, so here we go. Wow. You're getting it just as it comes by? Yep. Now what kind of speeds are you using here? Uh, as fast as this camera will go by itself. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the guy with the big camera here. So this is really nothing for you. Right, this is, uh, this is fun though. <laughs> yeah, okay, let's get, you, let's get a shot right here. Okay. See, you got two shots just like that. Right. Now you know Moybridge would have died if he'd been able to get <laughs> something like that. That's right. Do you ever think back to what those early pioneers must have thought when they were taking these kinds of pictures? Well, I think it would have been more, actually more exciting because you don't actually know what you have, you know, it, it would have taken longer to get your, your prints uh, back, you know, developed. And uh, with this thing, you just sort of hit play. And oh, you it's can all see digital, a, there it is. See what you got. Wow. See this. <laughs> it's all digital. <laughs> this would have been like a dream. It would have been. He wouldn't have understood it. <laughs> yeah, not at all. Well, we've had a great time. Now, what we're going to do, because we don't know what kind of pictures have been taken here today. Good ones. <laughs> I'm sure they're all excellent pictures. And what we're going to do, we're going to collect all of this film and develop it and use them as credits on the end of our program uh, to show the kinds of things that were done here today. 130 years after uh, Edward Moybridge made those famous pictures here. Great. That's it. That's been our day on the farm, <laughs> going back in time and recreating history right here. The motion photography of Edward Moybridge. That's a name that most photographers know. It's a name that everyone in California should know because not only was he a pioneer and the fellow who actually was the precursor to today's motion pictures. But this fellow was also a fine example of California's gold. Goodbye, everybody. Wave goodbye to our photographers. Goodbye. There they are. Now we're going to see what kind of pictures they took.
Well, hello, everybody. I'm Huell Hauser, and I sure hope you enjoyed our visit to Stanford University, where we discovered and recreated this important chapter in our state's photographic history. If you'd like to go on this adventure again or share it with family or friends, or perhaps donate a copy of it to your local school or library, it's available on video cassette and on DVD. All you have to do is call 1-800-266-5727 and we'll be glad to send it to you right away.